What do you want me to be viewed? Whatever you want to be. Stage is yours. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Davy Hutton. You probably know me as the most annoying guy on the radio, Davy Hutton. Quick sale, sold! <coughs> That's one of the things I do. I also run, I started up and run a charity called Finding Your Feet, which many of you will know, some of you won't. And we've been asked along here to speak. I don't know what I'm going to speak about, Jane, I really don't. Um, I have nothing to gain from this. Um, I'm not being paid to do it. You guys are unlikely to give me money. So why am I doing it? Sometimes you have to explore yourself. Sometimes you have to stand in front of people and see what comes out. Um, obviously we'll have a, a talk about the property market, what's happening just now, what we think is going to happen. And then we'll move on to some different stuff. Uh, when Paul McFadden phoned me up, uh, one of the things he asked me about was can you explain to people how you become an entrepreneur? <sighs> That's a really difficult thing to do because there's another word for entrepreneur and it's dickhead. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, really, it, really, it really doesn't mean an awful lot. It means enterpriser. It means to do. Kerr asked me about his Kerr works with me up the back there filming. And he asked me what entrepreneur was. Um, and it just literally is to do. In fact, I said to him, uh, the French don't even have a word for entrepreneur, which he swallowed, look, line and sinker. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you do anything, you're an entrepreneur. All of you sitting here are entrepreneurs. But don't go out and call yourself it, because it's, it really is a... Well, it doesn't do anything for me when I, when I read on your, your Facebook sites that that you're all entrepreneurs. The property market, let's start with that. What's happening with it? Brexit is the thing everybody's talking about just now. How is Brexit going to affect the property market? And as I'm unplugged and unscripted, feel free to shout out, stick your hands up whenever you want. You don't even need to stick your hands up, just shout out. How will Brexit affect us? Have any of you thought about it? What's it going to do? You're, you're nodding your head. What's it going to do? What do you think? Do you think so? Very What about if you cut out the immigration? There's a big chunk of your property rental market gone. You're not going to be able to. Well, you're really talking about hypotheses. You think what might happen. And that's really what risk assessment's all about. And all of you need to do this is risk assessment. It might have no effect whatsoever. It might have a massive effect. Jeremy Corbyn is talking about building a million houses. <coughs> Theresa May's jumped on that bandwagon. She's now saying that she's going to build 250,000 houses. How does that affect the property market? If you build a million houses and flood it onto the market, simple supply and demand tells you your prices are going to dip. Now, that would be okay, because all prices are going to dip, and it makes it easier to go onto the property ladder. But if you've built an economy, like we have, where everybody has a 90% mortgage or a 100% mortgage, and everything dips, then what happens is everybody dips into negative equity. Everybody becomes bankrupt. So, from a government point of view, that can't actually happen. They, they could build a million houses, and they'll never borrow money cheaper than it's available right now. And if you think about it, every property that you build as a government has an income structure attached to it. Either has a rental stream or you sell it and you get the money back. It costs the country nothing. <coughs> Except for the fact that it destroys the property market. It doesn't destroy it, it dips it. But we've elevated <coughs> the, the loan to value ratio to such an extent that we can't afford it to dip. So in reality, what they'll do, in my opinion, is they'll knock down a million houses to build a million houses. And that construction boom will feel everything coming out of the doldrums of where we are right now. Now, if you're doing your risk assessment, what are the million houses that they're going to knock down? Because these are the ones right now that are in free fall. I was at one a couple of weeks ago in Port Glasgow, 
and the lady had it on the market in 2009 for £65,000, didn't sell it, took it off the market, decided to do it up, put a new kitchen in it, and she wanted it back on the market now, and I can't get a home report on it above £30,000. That's how much that end of the market has dropped. That's the end of the market that ends up in the things that you saw in 2007, 2008, 2009 in America, where buy your house in Detroit for a dollar, kind of thing. These are the ones that might look attractive on paper, but in actual fact what they're going to be worth is a dollar at the end up. Now why does that happen? Why do they, they free fall like that? It doesn't sell at 60, and then somebody sells the property at 45. 45 then goes on to the sale price um, numbers. The next door neighbour comes to sell their property and her home report becomes 45,000. In an area where nobody's paying home report value, so it drops to 40,000 and so on and so forth and it just continues to dip at that. Now as soon as you dip below 45,000 pounds, you can't get a mortgage. So it becomes a cash buy only market. And if you're the cash buyer that's standing there, you're not paying home report value for it. So the 45 grand property effectively becomes 25 grand. And where does that stop? Now, if you're the guy that has the money and you want to be the landlord on the, the, these kind of properties, there's massive rental yields to come out of that. So there's a massive um, profit stream to come out of these kind of things. But it's destroying entire areas. Um, I'm going to try and talk really about things that have happened to me over the, the last week or so. Um, because it keeps it current, and I, I don't do this thing very often, uh, for reasons that I'll come to, to later. I was in Muirkirk on Monday. <coughs> I was going down to see a house down there. And for some reason I, I went to Straven, and I round the corner and it said, Welcome to East Ayrshire. And I'd watched the documentary the day before, and it was on Bill Shankly. And I'd only caught little bits of it. But for whatever reason, I googled Bill Shankly to find out where he came from. Because I knew it was a mining town and I knew I was coming into mining country. And it said that he came from a village called Glenbuck. Now, I'm from Ayrshire. I've been around Ayrshire most of my life. I've never heard of Glenbuck. So I stuck it into my sat-nav to find out where was Glen Buck, and lo and behold, it was 0 0.3 miles from where I was sitting in my car. And because I'm nosy, and because I was there, and because I didn't have a particularly busy day, I took the wee slip road up to Glen Buck, which is a single track road. It goes nowhere. It comes to an end, and there's a monument to Bill Shankly that Liverpool Football Club put there. The village is no more, it doesn't exist anymore, it's been flattened. It was a mining town, and I think they flattened it to open a, an open cast mine at, at some point in the past. Now, the kind of cool thing <coughs> is that Liverpool Football Club erected this monument to Bill Shankly on a place that nobody would ever see it. You have to do what I did and, and, and go looking for something to find. I thought, and I, it kind of moved me a little bit because I thought it was a, a really cool thing to do. It wasn't showy, it wasn't done to show off, it wasn't done for any reason other than this guy deserved it. It was a kind of eerie feeling. All that's there is a monument and no houses. So I went from there to Liverpool Football Club, incidentally, organised buses and pilgrimages. People come up and touch this monument <laughs> in the middle of nowhere and then go back to Liverpool. <coughs> and I went from there to Muirkirk. And the place I was looking at was a two bedroom end terrace, two up, two down house, ex local authority. Now, the two bedroom end terrace, by very definition, is worth more than a two bed mid terrace. It's worth roughly the same as a three bed mid terrace would be because it's on the end terrace. It's worth less than a three bed end terrace would be, and it's worth less again than a three bed semi detached would be. That's all common sense stuff. So I phoned the surveyor for a home report value. Two bedroom end terrace, he said 30 to 35. So now much of it's a minter. 35 to 40 tops and I said what if it's a minger he said 30 to 35 so there's largely no difference in price between a mint house and a minging house 
so then I looked at it a little bit further <coughs> and thought, how much is a three bed end terrace worth? It's like a couple of grand more. And what about a three bed semi? He said 40 to 45, 45 tops. And therein lies the crux of the problem. Because Muirkirk, bigger than a village, smaller than a town, almost every single property in that town is non-mortgageable. Now how does that pan out? Why would, what you could argue is that that marketplace is swinging back round to what it started off as. It was a council house town, everybody rented their property. So it's kind of swung back round now that everybody there is going to rent their property off of one of you guys. But for what reason? Because there's no coal mine there. So what I'm saying to you really is what might look very attractive on paper might be the worst investment that you ever make. Because who's the second person that's going to rent it? The young people don't want to stay there because it's too far from anywhere. Old people don't want to retire there. You can't get a mortgage on it. What happens to that town? And I was telling my dad, because um, this just occurred to me, what day is this, Thursday? I was down there on Tuesday. And on Wednesday, my dad happened to walk into the office and I was telling him about it. Just flippantly, as I've just told you about it there. And he said, so what are you going to do about it? And I hate that, <laughs> I hate that kind of thing, because I think, what am I going to do about it? And this comes round to who you want to be. What mark you want to make on the world? Because everybody's all about, I want to get rich quick. I want to be a millionaire tomorrow. It's not going to happen. It takes an awful long time to get there. First of all, you have to get something, and then you have to learn how to double it. And the hardest thing to do is to get that initial something. If you've got nothing to double it, you've still got nothing. Get yourself five grand. We've done this speech before. Five grand becomes ten grand. Twenty, forty, eighty, one sixty-three, twenty-six, forty, one and a quarter, two and a quarter. You know, that's, that's how you, you make your money work. But what I actually did about it, because my dad challenged me, was I sent a message to Brian Whittle, who's the MSP for that area. He's a Conservative MSP. And I sent one to Gene Freeman, who's the SNP MSP for that area. Because first of all, what you have to do is get up there and challenge the banks. Why will you not lend below £45,000? Why on earth will you not do that? Why will you penalise the people at the bottom end of the market? And if you destroy the bottom end of the market, you destroy the, the entire market. If you take away the bottom rung, the rung above it becomes a little bit more sugarly. So that's the first thing that has to happen. Why is nobody talking about it? And nobody's talking about it because from Manchester down the way you don't get properties under 45 grand. These MPs that I'm speaking to have no idea that properties cost as little as that. And they've no idea that you can't fund it. Now how difficult would it be for a government to come and say, you must give the first time buyer a 100% mortgage and not do it on a help to buy scheme? Because the help to buy scheme is destroying everything that we know in the property market. Young people, instead of buying a 40 grand flat, buy a 140 grand property in the Ferry Village because they put no money down on it. And that seems to be the mindset that people operate on just now. I'll buy myself a new Audi on a PCP, which I'll never own. I'll get myself a help to buy mortgage on a new build property, which is the only properties in the market that don't require a home report. So a builder gets to set the value at whatever he wants and you go straight into negative equity potentially. So we have a whole generation of kids now growing up who think the help to buy scheme is the way forward and want a flash Audi the same as all the pals have got. Nobody's creating any assets. Nobody's paying into a pension. Nobody's looking after tomorrow. Now, I'm deliberately painting this all in a kind of a negative mindset. There's loads of positives that come off it as well because everybody's now spending all the money. All the money gets spent on the economy. I've got a plasterer who works for me who constantly rips it out of me for being money bags, millionaire, you know, all this kind of stuff. He was at the Conor McGregor fight in Las Vegas a couple of months ago and currently he's sunning his arse in the Maldives. Everybody is living the millionaire lifestyle. 
but doesn't have a bean to their name. Is it wrong? I was at a guy in Lanark last week who wants to sell his property, he's been trying to sell it for years, it's valued at £850,000, wanted me to buy it. It's currently on the market at £600,000. And I had to explain to him, if I buy that property off of you, I've got 70 grand in stamp duty before I start. I've got 70 grand in stamp duty, I've got legal fees to buy it, legal fees to sell it, a home report to put on it, I've got to keep it for six months before one of you can get a mortgage on it. And then I've got to make my profit on it. So that 600 grand property becomes 450 grand. And he's got a 600 grand mortgage again, so that's a bit that I missed out. And driving a Bentley that he doesn't own. So for 20 years, that guy has lived the millionaire lifestyle, and he's now going to have to sell his property and rent a flat. Now, maybe he always knew that's what he was going to do. Maybe that was always his plan. I'm going to bring the kids up in the, in the big fancy house, give them their start in life, and then we'll retire to a button bend somewhere. Everybody makes their own uh, decisions in life. But when we talk about people who have no money, that's one of them that's driving the Bentley. It's not about the homeless people. It's not about um, people at the bottom end of the market. It's about everybody that finds themselves fully mortgaged in their house because I've mortgaged it and remortgaged it and remortgaged it and that's how I've funded my lifestyle. And it's not necessarily the way forward. Now, the flip side of that, if you spend all your money over your working career on everything you want to do, like the Maldives and the Conor McGregor fight, you live in a way that your parents didn't and your grandparents didn't. You experience everything that you want to experience. And I suppose at the end of the day, we end up in the same dementia hospital, in side-by-side -side beds, just that I'm paying for mine and, and you're not. So who's wrong? <laughs> and this is the problem with politics just now. Everything is so short-term, and I, I mix with these politicians, right up to the David Cameron was the most plastic politician I've ever met in my entire life. Nice guy, very entertaining guy, um, decent personality, no belief whatsoever in what he was talking about. And we need principle in politics. You guys have to have principle, you have to have a knowledge of what you want to do and where you want to go. As I said, I have no idea what, was, what route I was going to go down. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else I want to add on the, on the, the property market. I, I, as I stand here just now, I'm searching for the positives. I really don't know what they are. It doesn't mean they're not there. But there's a reason right now why you're not seeing an abundance of property programmes telling you how much everybody's made and doing up their house. If you remember back 10 years, Sarah Beanie was doing a programme a day and the person that she was advising would pay absolutely no attention to what she said mm -hmm. and she would get frustrated with them and they would make money anyway because the market was rising. And the market's not rising now. It's rising in some areas and it's falling in others. And this comes into your, your risk assessment thing that we spoke about earlier. The west end of Glasgow is rising, the east end of Glasgow is falling because it comes into that million house category of the, the Jeremy Corbyn building plan. And what happens is that separation gets greater and greater and greater. Does it snap? Eventually, do we get to a point where the only thing left for the poor to eat will be the rich? Do we end up putting a big fence around the west end of Glasgow so the east end of Glasgow can't get into it? And I'm in a fortunate position. I see all of these areas. I don't exist in just one of them. Um, so you get to see the publicity going out saying the property market's rising through the roof. And it's not rising through the roof, it's rising, in the roof, uh, rising through the roof because we're at record low property listings just now. Nobody's selling their house. So you said earlier on that Brexit has no effect on it. What the effect that Brexit does have right now, and it's not necessarily Brexit, it's political uncertainty. People sit on their hands and they do nothing. Nobody moves house. If nobody moves house and only one property comes on for sale in the west end of Glasgow and 20 people want to buy it, then the property goes through the roof. doesn't mean it's worth that. The, the activity levels right now on the property market are the lowest that I've ever seen. Now, I have to make a decision on how potentially I reshape my business. Do I go more into the rental market and take advantage of really high rental yields that we're seeing just now and try and buy in the areas that I think 
maybe they're at 35 grand just now, but maybe with just a little bit of work they could become 45 grand or 55 grand or 65 grand and therefore have a retail end use to them. That's one of the equations that you do. And if you're at that end, then you're looking at a 10% rental yield plus. So you should do okay at that end of the market. I wish the news was better. But there's always opportunities come out of these things. If we build a million new homes and that fuels uh, the, the, the massive activity that pulls you out of uh, recession economics, there's masses of opportunities to come out of that. I don't quite know what they are for me yet, but they are there. Now, we'll leave that to one side, we'll probably come back to it because that's what I do. One of the things that you guys asked me to speak about, what makes an entrepreneur? And all I can do is tell you how I operate. And one of the things I've become very good at is self-analysis. And it's something that you all need to learn. Everybody, everybody wants to get rich quick. Everybody wants to be a millionaire. Everybody wants to make loads of money. You first of all have to love what you do. You have to find the area of the property market that tickles you. And for some of you, um, it'll be buy to let. I personally don't have any buy to let stuff because it, it doesn't tickle me. I'm not organised enough for it. I'm not disciplined enough for it. And I don't really seem to get any uh, fulfilment out of it. There's, there's no big pot at the, at the end of the... Uh, there's no pot of gold at the end of the rainbow with it. All there is is people with their boilers broken and light bulbs out and leaky roofs. And if you can be motivated by rental yield, then that's great, but it's not me. If I was going to have a property portfolio, I would need to also have the property development because that is what motivates me. It motivates me creating something. Now, when I say that I've become reasonably adept at self-analysis, the things that have driven me my entire working life are common to all of us. It's fear and it's anxiety and there's a hefty dose of depression thrown in there as well. And it's about how you make these things work for you. If any of you have seen the videos that, that we stick out, Kerr did one a couple of weeks ago and it was the two Davy Huttons and it was me sitting side by side with myself, one being the estate agent and one being the property developer. And when I watched it back, me sitting with the suit on, talking about the property market as the estate agent, is a completely different person to the way I perform when I put a hat on. It's like a transformation in the... Um, I, I, it's almost a, a shift of personality. It's like a, a split personality, which we all have to adopt at some point. The reason I don't do these things very much is not what you would expect. These things scare me shitless. I have an anxiety brick in my stomach for days before that you would never think is there. But that's what drives you. That's what motivates you to stand up here and speak. And sometimes when you do it and you listen to your own words, you get a bit of clarity that comes out of it. And recently, I haven't had the fear in me that, uh, that I always had. And I realised that it was part of me and something was missing. And I've found myself now almost going looking for it. Put yourself in the, in the place that, that stretches you. And see what happens. What's, what's the worst that can happen here for me? None of you know me very well. We're not connected in business terms. The worst that can happen is I make a rank rotten speech. And somebody on the LG site I saw the other day had stuck something on saying, you know, good luck with your pitch. There is no pitch here. If any of you want to ask me any questions about what you're up to, everybody's involved in different things. I'll be as honest with you as I can be about what I'm doing. Um, and I'll tell you how I deal with the fear and the anxiety that sits there constantly. I operate the charity Finding Your Feet as well, which we set up for my sister Corinne. She runs it on a day-to-day -day basis. Corinne lost her hands and feet to sepsis about five years ago, 
four and a half years ago. And I found out, that, or I'm finding out, that the more that I do there, that's really what's given me the buzz now. It's really what's given me the sense of who I am and who I want to be. And many of you just now are starting your journey in property. And that will take you to where you want to be. It may not be property where you want to end up, but you need to view everything as a stepping stone. You're not going to be a millionaire next year. Your goal should be create something by next year. And it's break it down into the smallest stepping stones. I was working with a girl who had an eating disorder. And I knew a little bit about eating disorders. And she happened to be, I'll take my jacket off first because I'll she had to be a nurse in a hospital and I knew her from kicking about in the West End and I'd snapped my bicep muscle here playing rugby and my bicep was up around my shoulder and when I came out of theatre I was that kind of gaga way you are when you're coming round out an anaesthetic and she sat at the side of my bed and told me about being sick And a few hours later, she came back into the room and it, everything was like haze, that kind of dream sequence thing that you get. And I said, did you tell me you were sick? And she went bright red. And said, I didn't think you'd remember that. Now, she didn't think I'd remember that, but she hoped I'd remember that. That was the, that was the bit that said, help me because I can't actually ask for help. It's one thing that we should all learn. If you, if you need help, ask for help. People will give you it. I learned so much from her in terms of how heads operate and how nerves operate and how anxiety works. And one, one of the things that she had was a, a real OCD problem. And she was a hoot, she was a real, really funny girl, so you could, you could mess with her head in a really, really good way, for me anyway. And she met a guy from Cooper in Fife. And I said, there was a wee Cooper who lived in Fife, Nicotine, Nicotine. No, no, no. And I said, I tell you what, see, every time you say Cooper, you're now going to think Nicotine, Nicotine. No, no, no. In fact, here's the thing. You're now going to have to say Nicotine, Nicotine. No, no, no. <laughs> and she looked at me and, it, and she knew <laughs> that she was going to have to say it. To be fair to her, she did say it. And it was fine when she was dating the guy from Cooper, Nicotine, Nicotine. No, no, no. But then she moved to Cooper. <laughs> Nicotine, Nicotine. No, no. <laughs> and to this day, she still does. She avoids saying Cooper so she doesn't have to say Nicotine, Nicotine. No, no, no. Now, it sounds like a really stupid story. It is a really stupid story. But she got her own back on me. Now, I have to tell you, I don't have any OCD. But I was kind of up for this challenge and she said to me, I said, I've gone to Greg's and I've got a yum yum. She said, see from now on, a yum yum's a yum yum yum. <laughs> and I was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> and this was years ago. And I still do it. And everybody that works with me knows the yum 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 story. And if they see me in a bad mood, or they see me going down the way, somebody will say to me, go to Greg's. And the reason they say go to Greg's is because they know that if I go to Greg's and I've got to order a yum yum yum, <laughs> I have to do it in a really bold fashion. I have to stick the hat on and I have to go to the girl in Greg's and say, can I have a yum 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 please? You're probably wondering why I said yum yum yum. And then I have to go through the whole story in pantomime fashion, by which time the, the, you know, the people waiting for their sandwiches are laughing, the girls behind the counter are laughing, and what I've done is I've flipped my personality from one into the other. So it's a nonsensical story, but it's what works for me. There's other ways I can do it, but that's the way that everybody's come to, to identify it for me. How you turn that fear roundabout. From your point of view, it's how you turn that fear of starting into the fear of not starting. <clears throat> if I say I'm going to do something, I'll do it. That's why I had to message uh, Brian Whittle and Gene Freeman, because that's my way of saying, how, how do I sock it to my dad? How, how, how do I start to make something happen here? And in actual fact, if you think about it from a political point of view, if you can get the Conservative Party and the SNP working together to try and regenerate an area that's humped just now, it's a really good political message. And it's a really good of the people message because you're trying to help the people at the bottom end who are getting screwed. And if the people at the bottom end get screwed, ultimately we all get screwed. 
And that brings it back to Bill Shankly. He made the people happy. That's what it says in his statue outside Anfield. He made the people happy. Is there a better sentence that could be attached to anybody's name than that? I'm not massively political. I don't follow any particular political party. But I'm kind of fed up with right and left because it really doesn't work. Where is, where is right and wrong? Where does, where does that come into it? I want people to have belief in what they're doing and the way that you guys have to have belief in what you're doing. If you go back into politics of old, Tony Benn on the left was essentially the same person as Enoch Powell on the right. They were just people with different political messages but they were equally intelligent people. And you need to have that, people who can build an argument and people who can build a narrative that you can follow. And if you really want to be an entrepreneur, that's what you have to do. Go back to the entrepreneur thing. Everybody thinks that, that, that being an entrepreneur is about invention. I've never met an entrepreneur yet that was about invention. Entrepreneurs spot opportunities. Inventors invent things and very rarely become rich from it. Some entrepreneur comes along and takes it on and they're the one that make money from it. And what you have to do is take that project and take your step. And if it's the wrong step, you move steps and you end up here. But the fear of not starting is really what holds everybody back. If I say to you I'm going to do something, the embarrassment of me telling you that I've not done it is enough to make me do it. And you have to make that deal with yourself. I can't tell you all what your business plan should be because I don't know what you're doing. I can only tell you how an I analyse myself. When I bought a property in West Kilbride, uh, it was a 14th century castle, and that was the thing that I wanted to do from when I was a kid. And I used to tell people the story about how I tried to buy the Bar Castle in Lochwinna from a guy in Canada, and I wrote to him when I was 21 or 22 saying, he used to play in that castle when I was a kid, any chance of selling it for nothing? And Professor McDowell from Canada, was a very nice man, wrote back to me and said no. And that was, that was the end of that. But what it did was it planted a seed in my head, along with loads of other things that I wanted to do when I was 17. I wanted to do the Cresta run in San Moritz, I wanted to run with the Bulls in Pamplona, I wanted to go to Auschwitz, I wanted to uh, raft down the Zambezi River. And it was important to me to keep these little bucket lists before bucket lists were fashionable. And when you're 17, it's very easy to do all these things because you only need to do one every year, or one every couple of years, or one every three years. As you get old, I was 50 this week. And let me tell you, shit. <laughs> every, day, every day tells you life begins at 50. It's just shit. Anyway, you become aware that there's a whole lot less things, or there's a whole lot less time to do the things that you want to do. But what you have to do is keep for me, it's about the next five years in your life are the most important. Always look after the next five years. You're the youngest you're ever going to be. You're the strongest you're ever going to be. You're the fittest you're ever going to be. If there's things there that you want to do, do them. That brings it back to John the Plaster, who's in the Maldives. Fair play him. He's doing them. I've got... My attitude's kind of changing because in the last month or so, I've had a, I had a friend who died through doing a... Uh, a triathlon in Singapore, he drowned in the, uh, uh, in the swim leg, funnily enough. Uh, I've got another friend who this week was diagnosed with motor neuron disease. Don't know what's going to happen. So, whilst we're planning for the future and while we're building things, you have to live as well. And that's when it becomes vitally important that the thing you're doing is the thing that gives you the satisfaction. You guys are here because property's your hobby as well as your um, your, your income or you want it to be your hobby I, I remember start, I watched every Sarah Beanie programme there was I watched every Grand Designs and because I was, I was just really interested in property As, in particular it was lighthouses and castles and windmills that, that, that motivated me at that time, that's what I wanted to do historic buildings and one day the pub that I owned in Howard um, a guy came in with a rolled up Observer newspaper, and because I told the story about trying to buy the Bar Castle when I was 21, he said, There's a castle, and I opened up and it was on the back page of the Observer newspaper. Now, I laughed at it because I know nothing about castles, and I really hadn't given it an awful lot of thought since I was 21, other than telling the story that I once tried to buy a castle for no money. But what it did 
was it makes you take a step forward because the brass neck of telling the story or the brass neck of telling people that you didn't have the bottle to go and see the property that was for sale was, was a bigger fear than, than, than not going. And if you plant enough seeds in your head, at some point in your life, the sun will shine on them. You won't even know they're there, but they sprout. So keep thinking and keep imagining. I, I won't stop imagining what's going to happen with the property market. I'll keep thinking it, and I'll keep thinking it, and I'll keep thinking it, and I'll work it out. As we all will. But the beauty of these things here is that everybody gets to talk to everybody about what they think is going to happen with the property market. You can tell me you don't think Brexit's going to have any effect. I don't know what effect it's going to have, but the conversation that comes off it is the important thing. Now, okay, what else was I going to speak about? Harry Potter. Oh, Harry Potter! <laughs> I watch... Uh, Harry Potter's an interesting thing, actually. If you think what it's about, good versus evil, the battle in your head, the Dementors come and get a hold of Harry Potter and suck the life out of him. But at the time they suck the life out of him, that's the only time that he can see his dead parents. Because depression gives you a certain level of clarity. That's why I don't want to lose the, these kind of parts of me. But when I watch you guys... How many here came through the LG property courses? What these courses do, in my opinion, and I'm, I'm laying myself bare here for you so I'm perfectly prepared to have a rip at you guys as well, you'll get all the information that you need for the property market from these courses, but you need to adapt it to what you want to do with it. Now I'll tell you how these things work, I've never been to one of the courses, but every time there's one on, I get about 20 friend requests from you, from people that I've never met before. <laughs> And because I'm a nice guy, I kind of accept them until I get fed up with the motivational bullshit coming at me constantly. Now, <laughs> I understand why it's there. For instance, and I'm not having a pop at anybody here. Um, he says about to have a pop at people here. Alex, you, you stuck something out yesterday or the day before or something, and it was about today I'm a wolf, something like that. And it was, I mean, it was nicely written out. <laughs> That's the point. Because somebody comes back and sticks something on, saying, I'm a wolf too. <laughs> and then somebody else comes back and said, these are wolves and these are sheep. <laughs> and somebody else comes back and says, my friends are all wolves and your friends are all sheep. And for fuck's sake, guys, <laughs> what, what you've become is a flock of wolves. <laughs> it, it, it's... it's it's not nonsense what you put out. It's nonsense when everybody is coming back with the same stuff. And what you've got to be very careful of is not surrounding yourself with people who all say the same stuff. If you put something out in your Facebook thing, you don't want them all coming back and saying, brilliant, you totally agree, oh, you're on the ball, good luck. And your friend's thinking, what a knob. <laughs> <laughs> because it's balance. I mean, if I put something out on my Facebook thing, I've got a million people that come back and tell me I'm a knob. Trust me. Um, the, the trick for me is to stimulate debate. And they do come back and they offer different... We've, we've got threads on my, my Facebook thing that runs to like two and three hundred comments of everybody disagreeing with each other. But you learn stuff from them. You'll never learn anything from everybody telling you you're great. You know, if you go out and you're doing your first property development... I see it all the time. Look at the, look at the bathroom I've done here. You know, what do you do? You put a bath panel on. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it's, it's great to see people's enthusiasm for it, but keep it real. And you're all laughing because you know it happens. And, uh, you know, 20 years ago, you could lift things off the internet that were motivational stuff. Now, everybody does it. And as soon as you do it, I know you're not thinking. You're, you're just, it's just lazy, as you say copy paste. Take the thing that motivates you and put it into your own words and then it becomes something that's worth reading and you can do it with anything. The Harry Potter scenario, if you think about what Harry Potter's about, the basic fundamentals of it are the same as every other story that's ever done well in history. But if you want to write a book, don't write it about wizards. Take what it is that she's saying about good versus evil. It's the same as Luke Skywalker and 
Darth Vader, it's the same. If you think about what the Hunger Games is about, don't, don't, you know, there was, there was something that came out after the Hunger Games, I can't remember what it was called, the, the Diversion or something like that, Allegiance or something. It was more or less the same story again. It, and actually, there, there's an argument that says the entrepreneur probably does that because you can sell off the back of it. But think about, do any of you know what the Hunger Games is about, incidentally? What it was written about? There was a journalist who during the, the first Gulf War recognised, and those of you that are old enough to remember it, the planes going into Iraq and you would see the pilots crosshairs and then boom the building went. And she realised that with 24 hour news, for the first time ever, we were watching people die for our entertainment. And that's where the whole book came off the back of. If you then follow it through into what the story is about, you have a capital city doing very well wherever he's affluent and you have the districts all round about who are, if you like, the northern powerhouse supplying the, you know, the, the politics element of it's fantastic, but essentially it's always the same story, good versus evil the wrestle in your head Harry Potter and Voldemort are essentially the same person connected um, Luke Skywalker Darth Vader, essentially the same person connected and that comes back to the anxiety the depression, and, and, and we've all got it where anxiety becomes a problem is when it magnifies out of control, but we all have it. Why does it exist? It exists that if you get into a fight tomorrow, to the death, you don't want to go into that fight thinking about your wife and family and everything else. You, you have to be channeled totally on what you're thinking about. If I come into this with a brick of anxiety in my stomach, the only thing I'm thinking about right now is speaking to you guys. That's why it's there. If it magnifies out of control, I can't speak. And I've been there. And it's, and it's not pleasant. But what we're doing just now in society is we're creating an anxiety society. We're doing it with mobile phones and social media and you guys put something out and then you're worried about who's going to say something back. We all do it. And this kind of worries me. I'm off on a tangent now, that's what I do. The gun culture in the States... Where does that go if you create this society where everybody's having breakdowns and depression and anxiety, but everybody's got two guns? Mm. Nobody's talking about that. They're talking about the fact that there's a massacre every day in the States, but they're not talking about why it's happening and how our society's changing. And it's not all changing for the bad because we're constantly thinking. All of us are thinking all of the time now. There is no rest period. It's why you're seeing things like golf club membership disappearing because nobody's got three hours to stand in a golf course now speed golf will come out of that though <laughs> do, do you know it's in, you, you see cricket, not that I know anything about cricket but, but you know one day cricket's now a bigger thing than forget that I don't know anything about cricket <laughs> but society is changing for the better, technology is changing everything technology's held the development of everything back for the last 40 years. I remember as a kid reading George Orwell in 1984 and in 1984 everything was suddenly going to change and then 1984 came and nothing happened. Everybody sat and waited like, like <laughs> nothing happened but it's happening now and everything that was predicted then is happening now because it was all there in 1984. It was just held back by the petrocarbon industry. So now the if you like, the leading lights in our society are the tech companies. And the cars of the future will be built, or being built by Tesla, which was Amazon before that. They'll be built by Dyson. They'll be built by Apple. And the balance of power changes. It's not all bad, because you're going to develop... If you think about it, the other day I was talking to somebody. These wee hoverboards that all the kids are kicking about and it cost 100 quid each. The chair that you're sitting on just now, if you stuck four casters on it and put a hoverboard at your feet, you've just created a car. Now how difficult could this have been to do? For 40 years I've told you they can't make electric cars. Now in theory, power should become really cheap and everything should become really cheap to purchase. So, you've got a situation, so the last time I spoke to uh, ALG, we were talking about how the, the standard of living is going to fall over the next 30 years. Now, to, to go back over that, just for those of you that haven't heard it, the way out of the current economic crisis that we're in, I think the last time we spoke, Richard, you, you 
remember better than me, but I think the national debt at that time was 1.7 trillion, something like that. I checked it before I came through the door there. It's 1.94 trillion now, and it wasn't that long ago I spoke to you. How do you get out of it? The only way you get out of it is you export more stuff. If you don't make anything, you can't export more stuff, and it doesn't matter the fact that the pound's weak. So somebody said to me yesterday about if we come out the Brexit thing and there's no deal, we're just going to put big tariffs on and they're going to put big tariffs on. Well, what that means is your BMW coming into this country is now going to cost you 30% more. But the flip side is that the company exporting will make 30% more. But you're not exporting anything that costs you, the people that buy the BMW, the extra money. Now, what that should do is inspire everybody to buy British. But I don't see Morgan replacing BMW anytime soon. So the plan of how you export more stuff is a 30-year plan. And it's about reducing down the income of the normal working person over a period of 30 years, whilst the Chinese middle classes are rising. I mean, you get to a point of parity when the middle classes in this country earn the same amount of money as the Chinese middle classes, then by definition, it's as economic to produce stuff here as it is to produce stuff there. And that's how the balance changes round about. The problem for governments is how you do it without people rioting. Now, from when I first spoke to you guys, or oh, many years ago, we're now 10 years into that. And there was a thing I saw on Facebook, which is a font of information for me. Um, probably one of you guys that posted it. <laughs> but it was in 2007, a nurse, a starting salary of a nurse was £8.71 an hour. And that bought you 87 little chocolate Freddos at 10 pence each. The starting salary of a nurse now is £11 something and it buys you 30 something Freddos. Because the cost of everything has gone up and the cost of your wages hasn't gone up by the same amount. And we haven't really noticed because of all the technology that's coming out, we've all got phones and we can all do things for nothing that used to cost us money. And the technology stuff, is uh, there's a lot of good stuff attached to that as well. If we could produce stuff by solar and by tide and by uh, wind, energy becomes cheap. So th there is a lot of, th there's always a positive that comes with the minus. I find myself nowadays, I never stop thinking. Um, I wish I did. But at the same time, I want to be here for a reason. I don't want to be here to sell you guys anything. What I want to do is stimulate your brains into thinking. If you stimulate your brains and you constantly want to know more stuff, you accumulate more stuff. If you accumulate knowledge, you can do anything you want to do. The biggest lesson that I ever got was off of a 10-year-old a kid. 11 year old kid, was a primary 7 and I, was, I used to go around schools teaching kids how to be entrepreneurial and how to be all you can be and that kind of stuff and he was a wee guy that sat in the back of the class not engaging a bit like you and uh, I said what's your name and he said Robbie Scarf and this was 10 years ago um, but I remember his name, Robbie Scarf what do you want to be Robbie? don't know he must be something you want to do there must be some job that you want to do. He said, I want to walk on the moon. And if he'd been allowed to, by his face, or his facial expression, he would have said, I want to walk on the moon, you dick. <laughs> <laughs> How are you going to do I'll tell you, speaking to a classroom of kids is terrifying. Adults are, are easy because it's, you can kind of predict what adults are going to say and do. Kids come from all sorts of tangents and you learn lots. He said, um, I said, how are you going to do it? He said, what do you mean? I said, how are you going to walk on the moon? How are you going to do it? He said, I'll become an astronaut. How do you become an astronaut? He said, I'll be a fighter pilot. And at this point, I know I'm in a competition with an 11-year-old kid. <laughs> and if I lose it, I'm screwed. <laughs> how are you going to become a fighter pilot? He said, I've got a pilot's licence. And now all his mates are egging him on and everything. And it's like every day against me. How are you going to get a pilot's licence? He said, I'll join the Air Force. How are you going to join the Air Force? He said, I don't know. I said, I'll tell you how you join the Air Force. You get a degree. And to get your degree, you need to get your hires. And to get your hires, you need to get your standard grades. To get your standard grades, you need to pick your subjects. Next year, you go to the big school, wee man. The year after that, you pick your subjects. And see if you don't pick the right subjects. 
you're screwed. You're a dick. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but it was a lesson for me. It's about how far down can you break it down? You start off saying, I want to make a million pounds. You'll never do it. You have to say, what am I going to do tomorrow? And then what am I going to do the day after that? And it doesn't matter what you do. If you need to go out for the next year and wash cars to create your five grand, create your five grand, because that doubles to ten. But if you're sitting here with all the dreams of what you're going to do, and you're sat sitting with a big fat fuck all, that's what you're going to end up with. Find the way to make your five grand, find your way to double it. It's not that difficult if you break it down far enough. If it's daunting and you don't know how to do it, you've not broken it down far enough. Ask a kid. And I say that not to be funny. Kids do break things down because they need to understand that we don't. We, we just jump right to the thing that we, that we want to be. And the five grand money double thing, I did another speech to Clyde Bank High School and I didn't know it was a speech that I was supposed to be doing. The head teacher phoned me up and said, will you come and present our Enterprise Awards? And at that time, I was working on stuff through schools called Determined to Succeed, which was about how you integrate all subjects into, into one. So you would say, let's do a business plan for becoming a footballer. And then everybody's interested, and the guys that play football have now engaged with their, their arithmetic and their, their English. If you said David Beckham makes 90% of his money outside football, then it suddenly becomes cool and interesting. So this guy phoned me up and said, will you come and present these awards? And I said, no. Um, it's a Tuesday night. I go to the gym on a Tuesday night. He said, well, come after the gym. He said, no pressure on you. Just come up and do it. And I said, so I agreed to do it. And I went away up. And I had this very bandana on. And I had a big pair of shorts on that came to be here. And a, a big ghillie shirt with the sleeves cut off it. And I walked into a room that instantly I knew I had the dress code wrong. <laughs> which is <laughs> I'm kind of comfortable with now but at the time I wasn't quite so comfortable I had to kind of grow into to being me when I started off in the property market I kind of felt I had to look like an estate agent which I never ever did it didn't matter if I wore a tweed suit I'd walk through Postle Park and some wee guy would say you're a lot of pirate big man <laughs> <laughs> and I walk into this room and in the room was Nicola Sturgeon who was the education minister at the time um, there was the MP, the MSP, the Provost, the, the, you name it, they were all there, and me. And it was a, a really defining moment for me in my life. Because for the first time, having the dress code wrong didn't faze me. And I watched everybody else take a step back. And it was a real lesson. If you look odd and talk credibly, you become magnified credible. You become incredible. And it works the other way as well. If you talk a lot of shit, you're an arse. <laughs> and people aren't long in picking up on it. But for something to do, I picked up a pamphlet that was sitting there and it listed all the people that were in this room. It was at the kind of headmaster's room. There was no window in it. I remember that everybody was there with their chains of office on and suits and boots. And I looked down the list, and mine was the middle name, and it said Davy Hutton, guest speaker. <laughs> and that was my first introduction to having no speech in an audience. Uh, and I remember looking at the audience when, when I got shown into the room. It turned out it was the last thing ever to happen in Clydebank High School before they knocked it down and built a new school. And they'd invited back all the former pupils, Marty Pello and Wet Wet Wet, and everybody was there. was 800 people in this room and the, the elevated stage that you get with the wee tiny chairs. So I'm sitting in the middle of all these people with my knees up, kind of round my chin, and I knew that 800 people were entirely looking at me because they were, what the fuck's a pirate? <laughs> and, I, and to make it worse, the head teacher who I've never met in my life stands up and says, our guest speaker's Davy Hutton, he's going to tell you how easy it is to become a millionaire, and he's going to have you rolling in the aisles. <laughs> And I've got no speech. And I remember, I remember it actually going through my head. If I run out of this room just now, nobody knows who I am. <laughs> and I stood up. I've told this story before here. Um, it was just that I'd run out of other stuff that had happened this week. Well, I've just... Re remember me of the 10,000 hours. Remind me about that in a minute. So I stood up. And for the sake of something to say, because I had no idea what I was going to say, I said, many of you will be wondering why I'm standing here in a pair of shorts. I said, the truth is... I had no idea I was supposed to be making a speech. 
and I had no idea there was going to be 800 people in the room. And when I found out, I shot myself, and this is a spare pair of trousers that I had out in my car. <laughs> and the younger folk in the audience, the pupils that are all there with their ties on, they, they can all fall about laughing. The older people I can see going, off. <laughs> but it bought me time. And then I said, who wants to be a millionaire? And all the hands go up. And I picked one wee guy in the front row. I said, what age are you, mate? He said, um, 16. Can you save five grand before you're 20? Nah. I said, can you save a thousand pound this year? No. Nah. I said, can you do 18 quid this week? He said, I can do that. How are you going to do it? If I wash three motors, big man, I'll have 18 quid neighbour. <laughs> I said, well, get this. If you wash three motors every week for a year, you'll have a grand. And if you do that to your 20, you'll have five grand. So you can do it. So at that point, he's now agreeing that he can do the five grand. I said, thereafter, it becomes an investment strategy. Now this was 2007, just before the market crashed. So in retrospect, now I think about it, I gave them a whole lot of duff advice about the property market. <laughs> I said, if you buy a property at 50 grand and put your five grand down on it, in a year's time it'll be worth 55 grand. Your five grand's just become 10. You just doubled your money in a year. Because that's what you could do then. But let's do it over five years. Let's have a five year plan. If you take your five grand, you stick it in a bank, a building society, the stock market, art, classic cars, whatever you want to name, traditionally, your money will double every 10 or 12 years. That's the way the stats work going back the way. What that means is your five grand, if you invest it in almost anything, by the time you retire, if you're 20 years old, will become, and I'm standing on the stage frantically trying to work this out, it'll become, it'll become 65 grand. And he said, that's, that's good, isn't it? I said, I'll tell you what's good. If you make your money double every five years rather than every ten years, what do you think it becomes? He said 130 grand. And he's kind of, all his pals are patting him in the back for, for getting the arithmetic right. I said, it doesn't become 130 grand, it becomes... It becomes two and a half million quid. Now that was me calculating it for the very first time. It becomes, you're 20, how many doubles at 5 have you got before you get to 65? And then 5 becomes 10, becomes 20, 40, 80, 163, 26, 40, 1 a quarter, 2 and a half. It's not difficult to do if you start when you're 20. It's very difficult to do if you start when you're 50. <coughs> if you start when you're 20, or you start when you're 16, and you wash the cars, that's how you become a millionaire. And it really is as simple as that. And if you bring into the equation that that all comes off of the three cars that he washed in week one, it takes nothing into account of the money that he'll earn in his salary over the course of his, his lifetime. It takes nothing into account of the mortgage that he'll pay off over his lifetime, or the partner that he meets that brings money to the equation, or the inheritance that he gets off his parents. It's not difficult to make that work if you work on the small steps. And that's largely what I wanted to say to you tonight, is stop thinking on the end result and start thinking on the steps that you have to take. What were you to remind me about? 10,000 hours. 10,000 hours. Many of you have heard the thing that nobody's born brilliant. You have to put in 10,000 hours of practice before you get there. And I never really thought about it. But this week, I was dropping my wee boy off to school. I was going up Crow Road, and there's a set of traffic lights and a Pelican crossing there. And while I was sitting at the lights, there was a wee kid who was probably about eight, and he had the, the school shorts on and the knobbly knees, wee skinny kid, and his football. And he was just himself, and he was itching to get across the road. And then the lights changed, the wee green man came and he boots the ball across the road, right between both lines of cars, and it bounces off the wall at the other side, and as he's running across, he taps it, kicks it up, boots it, and boots it down the pavement and runs away after it. And it struck me that that kid wasn't born able to play football. He loves playing football. His 10,000 hours are not 10,000 hours of graft because he's doing what he wants to do. And that's the secret for everybody. Find what it is that you want to do. And if property doesn't give you that sense of enjoyment that that wee kid gets off of bouncing his football off of that wall, you're as well walking out the door just now because you're wasting your life 
and there's something out there that will tickle you for your 10,000 hours. I'm glad you reminded me about that because it's funny how, again, we seeds are planted. I heard that 10,000 hour story. I, I, was that rich dad, poor dad thing or something like that? Years, I, I can't remember. Who was it said it? It's Malcolm There you go. But what he did was he planted a seed in my head and it took that wee boy with his knobbly knees and his football to shine the sun on it, for it to grow, for it, for it to say to me, that, that's what it is. That's what the 10,000 hours means. And it's, a bit, it's easy to sit and listen to these things and all these cliches that get thrown about until you can take it and relate it to something in your own life. It doesn't mean anything. It's just a slogan. So whoever wrote it is irrelevant to me. What I remember is that wee kid with the football and the enjoyment that he got kicking off the football. Now, largely, that's all I've got to say to you. How long have I spoken for? When? No. Yes. If anybody's got any questions, I'm happy to take them. I'm not sure I can answer them. Um, has anybody got any ideas of where they think the market's going to go? Is anybody doing their own analysis that's drastically different to mine? I think you're absolutely right. And I think it's... Um, but then we all have to find ways of making money out of the false bubble. You could argue that the whole thing is a false bubble that's going to come crashing down at some point, but is it going to be 20 years' time? Or is it going to be next year? I was lucky enough in 2007 to get out because I saw it coming. Because on the news every night was the news report from the States about the subprime. And nobody knew what the subprime was. Everybody knows what it, what it is now, but nobody knew then what the subprime was about. And what everybody really wanted to do was to say, it doesn't really affect me, so I'm not going to pay any attention to it. And I was probably curious enough at the time to go find out what the subprime meant. I was also in the fortunate position that I was always scared of debt. And you got to remember at the time when I was building a property portfolio prior to 2007, it was easy. Buying a castle was easy because you went and signed a bit of paper that says I'm good for the money. And they gave you the money and, and, it, and it was a doddle. So anything that you, know, that you look at that became a property millionaire, don't fall into the trap of thinking they're smart because I'm not smart. I was in the right place at the right time. In retrospect, I was smart not to have massive debt. But I didn't have massive debt because I was scared. The fear stopped me doing it. So what I found was there was loads of people out there that had a hundred properties at a hundred grand each, or thirty properties at a hundred grand each. Let's keep it simple. So they had a property portfolio that was worth three million quid, and had thirty percent equity in each. And let's make it a third because it's easier to work out. So they had a million pounds equity in a three million pounds portfolio, and they were millionaires. And the wives were in Range Rovers and the kids were at private school. And everybody was patting themselves in the back for being really clever at leverage and everything that were the buzzwords at the time. Then the market dropped by 30%. And they went from being millionaires to being more diddly squat overnight. But the wives were still in the Range Rovers and the kids were still at private schools. And these were the people that developed the schemes, if you like, the, the, the creative finance deals that people are now going to jail for, the, the get-rich-quick schemes, because they had to keep the whole thing going. I was in the fortunate position that I didn't have three million pounds or two million pounds worth of debt. I had a million pounds worth of properties, if you like, that I didn't owe any money on. So the market dropped by 30% and I still had 700 grand. So when you've got something, protect it. If you don't have anything, gamble away, it doesn't make any difference. All you can do is win. But that was, that was the lesson for me. And, you know, I, I went to... I'm now overrunning, I'm I? went to a thing um, that Jones Lang LaSalle organised in, in Glasgow. And it was, uh, if you like, the great and the good of the property industry and, and me, because I knew somebody that worked in Jones Lang LaSalle. This was 2008. And I listened, I got a ticket for it because somebody dropped out and a friend of mine worked in Jones Lang LaSalle and he said, Dave, I'll give you this ticket, but come shut up, don't say anything. So I sat up the back and I listened to this economist stand and tell me how, don't worry, everything's, everything's fine. Um, we've got a blip here, but it is only a blip. And I can feel my hand <laughs> going up and I can feel 
my big mate Scott sitting beside me sliding down in his, in his chair and the guy, st- to be fair to him, the guy stopped his presentation and said what is it you want to say and I said I'm, I'm a diddy in this room and Sir George Matheson was there and Sir Peter Burke was there and all these great banking knights that they were called were all there and I said um, I've heard you say that this recession that we're heading into isn't as bad as what happened in 1990 I said I don't know an awful lot about it in 1990, as I remember, was a recession in property in London that rippled out around the rest of the country. London took a crash and it kind of fizzled out by the time it, time it got to us. And he said, well, in 1990, the term negative equity was commonplace. And this time round, I've yet to hear it mentioned. And I said, well, yeah, but in 1990... Um, what was the first bank that went bust in the States? No, before Lehman Brothers. Bear Stearns. Bear Stearns went bust. Uh, And Northern Rock had gone bust. I said, I don't remember there had been two banks going bust in 1990. And this is global. This is connected by the internet and connected. Stock markets are all connected to each other now. And you're telling me it's not as bad. And they did a vote in the room And my view was outvoted four to one in the room of people who should have known better. People who were involved in the financing at the highest level had no idea what was going on because they didn't want to have an idea. It was like turkeys and and Christmas. And that happened on the Thursday. And on the Friday, sorry, it was a Sunday, ALG went bust in... uh, Is that the right name I've got? EIG. (laughs) Yeah. I didn't want to break the news to you. <laughs> AIG went bust in the States on the Sunday and Lehman Brothers went bust on the Monday or it was the other, the other way around. But by Tuesday, I was an economics expert. I had newspapers phoning me up for quotes and things because I was the, the great sage of our time. <laughs> and it was as clear as day. Everybody looking back now, it was as clear as day but nobody wanted to see it. Open your eyes, question don't assume that the people above you are cleverer than you because they're just not. And I spoke to you with David Cameron and all of these people. You meet them and they're not clever. They're not any cleverer than you are. Don't make the false assumption that they are. So back yourself, question everything, make a million. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thanks very much, <coughs> David. So, we were doing... Trolled!